ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا ان من ازواجكم واولادكم عدو لكم فاحذروهم وان تعفوا وتصفحوا وتغفروا فان الله غفور رحيم انما اموالكم واولادكم فتنه والله عنده اجر عظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب before i discuss these two verses of the quran <coughs> i want to discuss the overall picture and then like i said we will be discussing some particular books and journal reviews on the issue of anger that are connected with our tradition and so uh and i also mentioned last time that out of all the emotions the one emotion that's most emphasized in the quran is anger even the point to the point where it's mentioned in surah al-fatiha ghayril maghdubi alayhim wala dhallin even though the word wala dhall maghdubi alayhim can be translated in two different ways maghdub alayhim maghdub means they are the source uh, they are the object of anger like salama yaslibu muslim muslim is the object of the one who surrenders so maghdub alayhim anger is upon them so one meaning is anger is upon them from who from allah the other is that anger is on top of them meaning it's just their state of being okay this is a well less known uh, explanation of ghayr al-maghdub alayhim meaning ghadab is alayhim ghadab is they are the object the object of anger is upon them and it actually works both ways if you look at one of the very famous hadith of qudsi of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in which allah the prophet said that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inni kama dhanna 'abdi anni i am as my servant thinks of me i am as my servant thinks of me so think of it this way if allah is angry with you right Why is Allah angry with you? Allah is as the servant thinks of me. So the servant is himself has anger. And because the servant himself has anger, it's a it's a reflection of the fact that Allah has anger on him. Meaning So the manifestation of the slave's anger is actually a manifestation of Allah's anger upon him. Are you following what I'm saying? Because Allah has anger on someone He is also full of anger. If Allah has mercy on someone, he will be full of mercy. Like for example, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when one when the Prophet was kissing uh, a child and a man said, "I never I you know I like a boasting I have never kissed a child in my life." And the Prophet said, "How will that happen if Allah has taken away mercy from your heart?" Meaning that the way your attitude towards Allah dictates Allah's attitude towards you in other words for example people that say there's no god there's no allah they say there's no allah atheists right so what is their attitude oh you know there's too much suffering right and they're obsessed with suffering and and they're obsessed with the negativity around them and they can't see the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because their attitude dictates allah's attitude for them so it's a, it's a it's a relationship so to say um And and what's very interesting out of all the emotions the emotions that takes away a man's cleverness and intelligence anger is the you know sadness you'll be feeling sad but sadness doesn't take away your intelligence your cleverness and Imam Ghazali mentions this we'll be studying Imam Ghazali so you know and and not only Imam Ghazali mentions this one of the books that I'll be quoting uh, I think it's overcoming anger it also mentions this over and one of the key themes in that book is that anger uh, is an inhibition to to cleverness intelligence and rationality so anyway so the thing that I wanted to mention actually has to do with the ummah as I was discussing last time but what I want to say is that what is anger because we're talking about Allah's anger upon his servants right so what is anger what is the result of anger anger is the result for human beings not for allah okay because laysa kamithli shay for human beings anger is essentially the result of things not going my way that's what causes anger 
Anger is the result of loss of control. Anger is the result of loss. When do we get angry? When somebody interferes in our business or criticizes us or somebody does something we don't want, right? Somebody who it puts us out of control. And putting someone out of control, anger is related to another emotion. Remember we talked, is shame. Shame. And the word shame, the word lawam, the word shame, has two meanings in Arabic that are interrelated with one another. So keep this in mind. On the one side, I'm talking about Allah's anger upon the community. Okay, because you'll see, because the question I want to answer is this. The question I'm trying to answer is this. That does Allah's, does our anger with our situation as Muslims, what do I mean by that, our situation as Muslims? I mean our sense of loss of control of our situation. Do we have a sense of loss of control of our situation? Yes or no? Yes, we have a sense of loss of control of our situation. Does that cause guilt? I will define what is guilt. But yes, it causes guilt. Now the next question is that if in the outside world, in the outside world, if I don't feel honorable, if I feel somehow I'm being judged by every person I meet, every person I meet, I know he's looking at me as a Muslim. Right? And I feel judged by every person. And I have this sense of loss of control. Then does that have an effect upon her family life? That, you know, that internal subconscious stress of the way we feel out of, that things are out of control for us is an extra element that we carry as Muslims that other people don't experience. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Everybody following what I'm saying? Because of the loss of control that we experience in the outside world, oh, we, it's not that we experience it. It's our own internal sight, our own attitude of the fact that we feel maybe the others are judging us, the others maybe don't have a good opinion about us, whether it is consciously being thought of or subconsciously being thought of, but it's there somewhere, right? And as an ummah, do we feel that we're out of, our situation is out of our control? Well, that's a cause of rage. That's a cause of anger. That's a cause of not only anger, but also shame. So when you're in your, in, and we have to realize collectively, we are, we are angry, we're upset. Collectively, we are. And we deal with it different ways. Some people may deal with it by, by surrendering to that. Some people may express that anger by doing silly things, uh, maybe like insulting or suicide bombings or whatever you want to call it. I'm not going into that. Or other people may uh, deal with it like trying to be apologetic, like we call the disease to please. Right, the disease to please. So Muslims are trying to please everybody around them, hoping that uh, everybody will be okay. But essentially, the working factor behind all of that is a sense of anger, and that anger is manifested by the sense of victimization, which is itself a sense of helplessness. And so, it's, do you, is everybody following what I'm saying? So, just so that I can, before I go further, let me also define what is shame. Shame is a sense lawam. And you know, lawab means to feel shame. لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة. I swear by the day of judgment, and I swear by yourself that blames you. But the word blame also means shame in Arabic. Okay. أن أقول بالحق. This is Sahih Bukhari. أن أقدس the bayra that they used to take with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. The last wordings of it was. أن أقول بالحق أينما كنا ولا نخاف في الله لومة اللائم. I will say the truth wherever I am, and I will not fear the blame of any blamer. So over there, نفس اللوامة is that guilty feeling that you have in the ayah that we read. Huh? That part of you that feels guilty when you do something wrong, you feel what? Guilty. So that نفس اللوامة that makes you feel guilty, that same word also means to what? Blame, because when you feel guilty, the general response to feeling guilty is to what? To blame the other. Shame, lawam, is a sense. This is now the, the psychological aspect of this. Shame is the sense of disconnection. When you feel disconnected from yourself, why do you feel, I wasn't supposed to, I, wasn't spo I was supposed to do something and I didn't. I feel what? 
I feel something pricking with me, right? Haka fi sadrika. Right? Al ithmu ma haka fi sadrika. Sin is what pricks your soul. Right? Why it pricks your soul? Because something you knew you were supposed to do, you didn't do it, and now there's that disconnect, that feeling of discomfort. That's sin. That internal feeling of discomfort is the sin. That's the definition of sin. And how and not only do you feel that within yourself, nas, and you also dislike that other people should know about that. You feel internal pinch and you don't want other people to know. If I missed my prayers, uh, let's say at one point, let's say at Fajr time, I didn't pray. I feel guilty within myself because I feel a sense of disconnect. Disconnect from what? Disconnect from what I know I should be doing to what I actually did. Okay? Or a shame in the other sense could be taken as, let's say somebody has a fat nose, right? And he feels, what? Shame. What, is, what does that mean? That he, there's a disconnect, he doesn't want it. Right? He's sensitive to it. He feels, and that shame leads to when, if anybody will comment on his nose, for example, he's going to reciprocate by causing blame. Okay? So this is anger leads to blame. Remember this. Anger leads to shame, and anger leads to blame. So these are two interconnected things. By the way, uh, so there is the anger that the people have as Muslim community, we have a sense of what? Anger. And that anger as a Muslim community that we have is the sense of not being in control. We're not in control of our destiny. Because you're angry when things don't go your way, as we will study in the various uh, research work. You're angry when things don't go your way. And when things don't go your way, you feel a sense of disconnect. Because why? Let's say in our relationship to Allah, for example, we know we should be on the top. Right? We're being told you have to be on the top. The fact that we're not on the top makes us feel ashamed. Which makes us feel out of control. Which then, the result, the negative result is we're blaming others. Oh, it's because of the Jewish community or it's because of these people or because of these people. And so we're blaming others rather than proactively doing the right thing. The escape, the psychological escape of anger is to blame. And the psychological escape of shame is to blame. Right? So like in, in case of like uh, relationships, you know, if the wife says something uh, to the husband, let me give like a, a real life example that is a little bit sensitive, but anyhow it works. The wife says some comment about the husband-wife intimacy relationship. She says some comment and the husband's of course, you know, the male eagle is very fragile in such a situation. And uh, so she makes some comment about his intimacy. And so he feels a sense of shame. And one way to deal with that shame is to blame her instead. Instead of dealing with maybe, let's say if she said, I think you should go to the doctor, he may resort to blaming her. Uh, so that's an example. So what have I done so far? So this is not only happening at the individual level. But this is happening at the collective level. Because we as an ummah have a sense of loss of control. As an ummah. We as an ummah feel angry. We as an ummah feel a sense of shame. And we as an ummah try to blame others for our problems. Or blame each other. Why do you think it is that the most fragmented place in the Muslim community is the masjids? Because it's playing out something that's very deeply psychologically true about us. There's hardly any masjid that doesn't have one level or another level of internal strife. And you know, strife is okay. There can be healthy conflict or there can be an unhealthy conflict. But the, the type of conflict we seem to uh, manifest in our communities is not the healthy conflict type. It is the conflict that is not very healthy. And so we have to recognize this internally within ourselves. And what Islam wants, instead of playing the blame game, what Islam wants or Islam would have wanted is that we get, we get anger, angry not for ourselves. Because anger is also related to the ego, right? And, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. But that we have what we call moral anger. We're angry because something is wrong. Not at a particular person. Even Omar bin Khattab, he never got angry for himself. 
He never got angry for himself. He got angry because when, when that lady put that boiling water over, over Omar, he forgave her, right? So he, Omar got angry for moral reasons, for, because something, something was wrong done to someone else. Or because something was morally going wrong, so Omar was getting angry because of that. Uh, by the way, I don't remember if I said the dua, Rabbi Shahani Sadri wa Yisrli Amri, wa hamil waqdata min lisani yuf al qawli amin ya Rabbi. So, we have loss of control, we have lawab, the, the anger relating to loss of control, and then we have shame and blame, we have a sense of disconnect, and, and then instead of having moral anger, which is, kuntum, now notice, kuntum, uh, Kuntum khaira ummatin, ukhudijat lin nas. Right? You're the best of people taken out from mankind. So, what is your uh, your function? Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhuna an al munkar. Your anger is because when you're enjoining good and forbidding wrong, there is a certain there's a certain activity there, a certain haraka there. So, your your aggressiveness is on the moral anger, which is to enjoin good or forbid wrong, and that is the. The, the result that should come out of, not for yourself, right? You're not angry for yourself, but today the ummah is angry for itself. We're angry as a community about ourselves, about our own situation. And that is out of, really out of a sense of shame, out of a sense of blame, if we're blaming each other, and out of anger, and lack, out, of, uh, out of not being in control. And so, now, this collectiveness, and by the way, Collective subconsciousness, Carl Jung talked about this, this very amazing concept in, in, in psychology, which is that there are things about any community that are, that are true at the collective level. And it doesn't need to be explained at the individual level. I'll give you an example. Like we have a collective awareness. Okay? By and large, for example, when 9-11 happened, this is a good way of explaining it. When 9-11 happened, Every Muslim, no matter how he explains it, whether you want to go with conspiracy theories or whatever theories, every Muslim, no journalist wrote an article, by the way, Muslims did not do this. Or by the way, there must be something wrong with this picture. But by when this event happened, there was a collective understanding that something is missing from the something is missing from the picture. Now, now what it was, what it wasn't, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in just explaining this concept that we as a community, right, without somebody explaining something to us, we have a collective understanding of how we see the events around us, how we interpret events around us. This is our collective reality. The same thing is especially with the Jewish people. They tend to collectively interpret events around them in a similar fashion, okay? So then what happens is when you're angry and you feel shame and then what happens? Then you have, uh, I don't have a good word before that, so I'm just going to make up one word. It can be called the Bani Israeli syndrome, okay? Which is uh, the syndrome of because you're victimized, and this is true by the way, when people, like in psychology we know this, like uh, if somebody is victimized, they have a greater tendency of victimizing others, okay? So like the Jewish community is victimized, so now they're in Palestine, and now they're victimizing others. This is this is a, a common, very common theme. Uh, a lot of the people, like uh, in different communities, uh, even let's say African American communities that have been victimized, and then when they get some sort of authority and power, they tend to uh, misuse it, and so on and so forth. So this is a common. It's nothing about African Americans or Jewish people. It's about a human trait. Okay. So when we feel victimized then we will tend to victimize, we're more prone to what? Victimizing others. And this is what's really playing in our families. Because we feel at a subconscious level, at the collective subconscious level, because we feel that we have been abused and because we have been hurt. So even like many times, just in normal situations, I can give you an example. Many times you're angry and you have to take out your anger on someone. Right? And you'll yell at somebody, even though you're angry at somebody else, but you'll yell at somebody else. So it's, it's kind of like that situation where we, at a collective level, feel victimized. And when we're home, and the people that are depending upon us, or they're, they're dependent upon us emotionally, 
uh, economically in different ways they may de be dependent upon us then that gives us an, it, we become vulnerable to uh, venting out fr frustrations right we become vulnerable to venting out our victimization our frustration our helplessness our sense of being out of control our guilt uh, and, and, and our anger becomes a blame upon the people that are what that are on our dependency and so this is something that we need to be uh, very careful about as a Muslim community. Every brother and every sister uh, should realize that we're carrying this, you can say, extra burden in our back. That has to do with our connection with the community that is essentially dysfunctional. And that dysfunctional community is affecting us individually in our, what? In our families. Is everyone following what I'm saying, right? It's, er, yes? Everybody's following. Yes. So this is my introduction and my summary of the whole thing that I wanted to go over. Now, uh, let me start by uh, these verses in Surah al <coughs> and, uh, and let's understand these verses in light of what I just said. And then we will study what Imam Ghazali has said. And then we're going to study uh, three books and one uh, case uh, study on differences of anger uh, in, in male and female, how they're different. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, Oh, you people who believe or claim to believe, inna indeed, okay, min azwajikum wa awladukum adhullakum. Indeed, amongst your wives and your children are your enemies. So notice here, by the way, it has the word min azwajikum. It doesn't say, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, it doesn't say, oh, you people who believe your wives and your children are your enemies. It doesn't say that. It says, min azwajukum wa awladukum adhuullakum. Min means they're not, it's not like they are the enemy. They have the potential of being your enemy. There's something about them that can become your enemy. Something about them can become your enemy. So how are they your enemy? One is, number one is if you are upright person, then why will you consider them your enemy? Now, before I come to this ayah, let me show you the next part. By the way, this is one of those verses that if you read enough books, you'll come to know. This is one of those verses that only and only and only Allah could have said. Because because why? I will show you why. <coughs> On the one hand, Allah is saying that they have the potential of being your enemies. That on the other side, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Wa in ta'fu wa tasfahu wa taghfiru. One word used, they're your potential enemies, balanced by three words of mercy. You see, this, this, human beings don't have this type of balance. Every human being who comes up with the concept, it's always fragmented. It's never holistic. You know, so if somebody writes a book, okay, your, your children and your wives can be a problem for you. And then he'll just focus on that. Right? And then another person will write a book on how you can be intimate with your family. He'll write a book just on that. But you'll never find a book that combines the both. Never. I, I like basically challenge anybody. So, now notice, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ أَدُوهُمْ لَكُمْ They're your enemies. فَحْزَرُوهُمْ Beware of them. فَحْزَرُوهُمْ So beware. Take precautions. وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَهُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا If you're kind and overlook and forgive them, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ Then Allah is also غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ Allah will forgive you if you're willing to forgive them. And certainly if you forgive them, then who is Allah to not forgive them? Right? So this ayah is balancing this. Now, the point, I, uh, one thing by the way, adu'ul akum is meaning what? There, there are different words for enemies, and there are two, two essential words in the Qur'an for meaning enemy. One is adu, and the other is baghda. 
And Imam Ibn Athir, one of the great Mufassirin, you know this guy, he did a tafsir, this is how his tafsir is. I'm going to show you, this is like a miracle tafsir, okay? One of the miracle tafsirs. He takes every word, almost like so many of the Arabic words, and he plays with the Arabic, and he uses the Arabic letters of the words to show you what the meaning of that word is. So for example, Hamd can become Madaha. Hamd means to? Praise. Madaha means to? Praise. So he takes every word and he shows you what the meaning of that word is, like ilm and amal, for example. And Ibn Athir, he, in quoting, he quotes like, for example, there's one part of the Qur'an where this a'da'a wal baghdad they come together. A'da and wal baghdad come together. Yes. So he says, he quotes other ulama what they said, and then he says, well, Using this science, Baghda is change the words around it becomes Ghadab, which means anger. This is why I'm talking about this ayah, because it has to do with anger. Adu'ul lakum doesn't mean be their anger. There's no anger involved here. Adu'ul lakum means the one who strategizes against you. Baghda is that enemy that you have rage against, you're angry against. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying that you consider them your enemy as in you are, what? Angry with them, no. That will be baghda. They are your enemies and you should have rage against them, no. Just know that they are strategizing against you, so then the proper word is used, fahzaruhum. Which means beware of them. Right? Because when they strategize, then or, or the strategy involves being, being beware of being. Be, beware of them. Okay. So, Ya yuhil ladin amanu inna min azwajikum wa awladikum adu'ul lakum fahzaruhum wa in ta'fu and definitely in ta'fu wa tasfahu wa ta'firu fa inna Allah ghafur rahim. So, you know, this is one thing about the family life that basically you, and, and, and I'm going to talk about, but just keep this ayah in mind, and then I will talk about this ayah, I'll refer to this ayah as we look at the different uh, other aspects that we need to study. So just keep this ayah in mind. How much time do I have? I don't know. Huh? I heard you 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Okay. Now we're going to <coughs> quote some of the aspects that Imam Ghazali uh, recalls regards to and you know Imam Ghazali why Imam Ghazali because he specialized in giving nasiha Imam Ghazali what specialized in giving nasiha advice and so he has if, if you ever want to know advice for something advice nasiha uh, even uh, Iqbal says in one of his poetry uh, he says something like uh, he says uh, uh, Rituals are left, but the spirit of Bilal, when he gave his azan, was something else. Rasme ragi ruhe Bilali nare. Talqine ragi, no, uh, something about talqin, you know, giving advice. Talqine ghazali nare, something, and then talqine ghazali nare. Do you know the word? Okay, I'm forgetting. You're forgetting, Ajahn. So, nasiyate ragi talqine ghazali nare. Rasme ragi ruhe Bilali nare. Something like this. So, so Imam Ghazali is known for his nus, his sincere advice. So he, and of course, uh, you will see, and it's very interesting, if you take Imam Ghazali on one side, and the research work that's been done by the psychologists, the, uh, Imam Ghazali has some interesting uh, things to say in comparison to them. So let us just uh, get into this. So how does Imam Ghazali, and then what is it that we're discussing here, so that everybody's clear? When we get angry, there are certain triggers, or you can say push buttons, that when you're getting angry, the first thing to know is to become aware of your anger, right? So now we're talking more practically on the ground, and uh, even though I have some theoretical things to cover, but I'll be talking more on the practical side also, uh, inshallah. So, uh, so, as far as anger is concerned, there are triggers that make us angry. Different people have different triggers. Okay? 
And different people have different triggers, maybe sometimes even by different people. Different things will cause a certain person to be angry. And so the first thing to do is to become aware of this. So I'm going to read Imam Ghazali's work only from the perspective of... And then Imam Ghazali asks a very important question. We'll be dealing with that too. So Imam Ghazali starts his whole introduction by quoting this hadith. So I'm not necessarily going into it. I'm just kind of like going over what he said. It's what I'm going to go over through the next few minutes, the next 30 minutes, is going to be haphazard. It's going to be what? You need, at the end, I'll try to tie it all together. Because I'm trying to put different works together and it's sometimes not as efficient as, as, as I would like it to be. So, Imam Ghazali quotes, starts by quoting a hadith, Whoever curbs his anger while being able to act, Allah will fill his heart with certainty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever curbs his anger, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be able to Cur uh, fill his heart with anger. And of course, now when we're understanding this in, 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 in light of what I've said, anger means you're out of control, being in control, being able to drink your anger, so to say, is the ability to be in, stay in control, and to keep your rational mind still working. So, uh, so, are all kinds of angers meant here always? Meaning, are there instances where anger can be justified? This is the question. And the way I want to answer that question is by looking at this research work, which is, uh, I'm going to go to a particular page to answer this question. So there are two things, three things actually. There's anger suppression, which is what you were talking about the other day. Anger suppression is the ability to suppress your anger. Okay, And then there is, Anger expression. The expression of anger is to let your anger out. So there is anger suppression, then there is anger expression, and then there's anger control. That how much and when you are supposed to suppress your anger and when you are supposed to show it. The management between this, between the kadhimin al ghayb if you want to use the Quranic term, those people were able to just take in their anger, right? Swallow their anger. And the expression of anger, I've already given the hint to this, but is there, at what point do you suppress your anger? And at, for what reasons, in other words, do you suppress your anger? And for what reason do you express your anger? And how do you stay in control between this anger suppression and anger expression? How do you keep a balance? And because just never showing anger will not do, will not be, is not what Islam wants. Islam doesn't want that you never show anger. Nor does Islam want that you're always suppressing your anger. So when you're in the family situation, right? Now notice in that ayah, Allah mentions three things. Not one thing. There are three. Number one is, Adu'ullakum fahzaruhum. So one is, they're your enemies, they're plotting against you, and you be beware of them. And now you can deal with this in the following ways. First is, of course, if they do something wrong, you can point it out. The second thing is, the, the, uh, I want to talk about tasfahu. Tasfahu means to overlook. It's not necessary if your husband, your, son or daughter or wife or husband, whoever, is doing something you don't want, that you must say so. Sometimes it is enough that they know that you know that you know that they know. Meaning, you told your son not to do something, right? And he's doing it in front of you. All you have to do is give him that look. But you don't have to necessarily, what? Say something. It's enough that he, can, he will feel guilty inside just by knowing that you no. know. So it's not always, and this is what Allah says, they're your enemies, yes, but don't make your family situation a war zone. Because the family situation, no matter what it is, and this is advice for especially, you know, sometimes, let's say the brother becomes religious and the wife is still not religious, and, and let's say the wife still doesn't do hijab and she doesn't want to do hijab and the brother, he's going to the masjid five times a day, and there's a potential there that this house, which is supposed to be a place of what? Tranquility will now become a war zone. 
And it happens. And the thing is that don't do that because you're, you're not going to be... We've talked about how to change, what causes change in, in, the, in the female species. We talked about this, that you, know, you can't change them. They're, if you try to change them, they'll what? They'll break. So you can't do that. You have to use, you have to use kindness, really. And, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that don't let your house situation become a war zone, ever. You were not religious, she was not religious, you became religious, or he became religious, and she became religious, and he's not religious. Whatever the situation is, the situation should not be that you are now going to make your own household a war zone for yourself. This has to be a place where your, uh, your, your house should be your source of tranquility, right? Your source of... Uh, of peace and tranquility. Yes, and now you need to uh, peacefully, tranquilly figure out how you want to bring her to where you are or if there's a need, then you need to peacefully part because what you don't want is the house not to be a house. Okay, so in تَعْفُوا This is why the next surah is after Surah Al-Taghabun I'm reading uh, the next surah, Surah Al-Talaq because if this, and this is why the surah is ending with the situation of the house going into Surah Al-Talaq because sometimes you can't maintain that peace and sometimes the best thing maybe, I'm not saying in every situation, for example, let's say some brother, he became Muslim, right? And now his wife, she's not willing to live with him or she wants to cause problems for him because he's Muslim. So now this may be a situation where he may consider divorcing her, moving on to the next phase in his life. So, وَإِن تَعْفُوا تَعْفُوا means what? تَغْفِرُوا is forgive. تَعْفُوا is forgive. Be kind. It's not necessary that if they did something wrong, you have to yell at them. You can also say the same thing to them in a kind way. Even though they're potentially your enemy. And you can see them, things strategizing against you, so to say. Right? But in تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَهُوا And ignore them. Just ignore and, and just forgive it. Don't even say it. Don't even let them know that you know. Don't even let them know that you're ignoring them. Just let it go. Let it slide by. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Then Allah is غَفُورٌ and رَحِيمٌ Meaning, غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ If you combine this ayah with Surah Al-Fatih, uh, it would mean, I, I don't want to go into the details of the ayah, but uh, إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا Then what's the next ayah? Why does Allah say to the Prophet, I will forgive you? It doesn't mean forgive here. And that's what I mean. Over here it means Allah will give you more guidance. In, in short, um, it means Why? Forgiveness can also be the completion of Allah's ni'mah. It doesn't have to be necessarily for a sin. But some, some ni'mah that was being withheld is now given back to you. So it can also come in that sense. Anyway, this is a longer discussion. We have to probably go into the shura in some detail to, to do that. But all I'm trying to say here is, in, um, indeed, in Ya Yuhilladina Amanu, in Namin, Azwajikum wa Auladukum, Adu'ullakum, Fahzabu. Beware of them. The word hazab means to beware, like, you know, somebody's going to strategize against you, you're being aware, uh, be aware of them. And then, وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا وَإِن وَإِن تَصْفَهُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ رَحِيمُ Then, you notice this, now, this is not part of the topic today, but I only want to have you appreciate the ayah of the Qur'an a little bit in a de more detailed way. If you notice, the next ayah, after Allah says, Allah continues the topic. Again, Allah says, Innama. Now, Innama is in Arabic what we call Hasr. Now, in the first ayah, Allah mentions the wives and the children. In the second ayah, with Hasr, Allah mentions not the wife, but the children and the wealth. So, with Hasr, Hasr means like Innama la amalu binyat, meaning Innama means only. This is it. Only this. This is the only reality. Innama means, this is the only reality. Innama amwalukum wa awladukum fitna. One was aduwullakum over there. Your family is doing things that will take you out of your pathway. 
they're strategizing to move you out of, like drop you, remove you from your pathway. Then the second is, your children and your wealth are a fitna. And fitna is allurement. In fact, one of the derivatives of the word fitna in the Arabic language is fata. A beautiful young woman is called fata. A beautiful young woman. Because why she's alluring? She's attractive. Right? So your children, meaning your fruits of your life, your children and your wealth is fitna. It's, it has a certain attraction. It has a certain allurement. So with wives, they're not going to be able to fool you as an allurement necessarily. But so this distinction, one is adu. They will request things, ask things, strategize that will take you out of the pathway. But then there are those things that you will go to. See, adu'ul lakum is strategy against you. Fitna is something that you will be attracted to. You see the difference? Adu is somebody plotting against you. Fitna is something that you're moving towards. That's the difference. So now, with wealth and children, they have a certain allurement that will take you out of the pathway. Either somebody will push you out of the pathway, which is adu'ul lakum, or you will get attracted to something outside the pathway and you will move in that direction. So this, and then innama is emphasizing here that this is definitely the bigger thing that you need to be aware of. This is this innama. If you look at it from the perspective of Arabic grammar, innama is more than any, any uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hasab. It's, it's, it's a complete, uh, this is the main thing. It, confine, right? it confines the meaning. It confines the meaning. It borders and you cannot go out there. Right. So, يَا أَيُّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّ مِنْ And over here, it's also reduced by the word min. So, إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ أَدُوُّ لَكُمْ فَحْزَرُوهُمْ وَإِنْ تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَهُ وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ إِنَّ مَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ أَجْرٌ So, if you beware of them pushing you out of the straight path, Allah is Ghafoor Rahim. And if you stay away from the allurements that are outside the path that you may go toward, that is Wallahu Ajrun, Indahu Ajrun, Azim. So, why this is? Because this is, I can't go into the details of this because I'll be going out of topics. But what's very interesting is, is that these allurements, like wealth, right? So for wealth, Allah says, Indahu Ajrun. In place of wealth and children, which is the fruits of humans, is the word ajar. So it's, it's balanced properly, right? And in balance of enemy is what? Forgiveness, right? So it's, it, the ayah, every ayah is balanced in this way. I mean, this is a very interesting subject, but uh, this is part of the Ijaz of the Quran. Yes? There's another ayah, Shaykh Omar. وَنَبْلُوَكُمْ بِالْخَيْرِ وَالشَّرِّ فِتْنَةِ Fitna, yes. Which is related to... Right, 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 right. We will test you with good and bad uh, as a fitna. So, let us now come to our situation here. So, understanding this in the sense of... Ang so now take this ayah of they are your enemies and put it in context of there is anger suppression and there is anger expression. Islam doesn't want that you don't have anger. But Islam wants you to, the main thing is, as you will study, is that as long as you're able to maintain your mental state. Because anger leads to, out of all the emotions, anger is the one emotion that makes your, your, your rationality go away. Right? You're angry and you're going to hit somebody. And at that moment, you're not even able to think of the consequences of what you're going to do. And that's not true of any other emotion. You can be depressed, but you can still think of consequences. You can be in grief, you can be in fear, you can be uh, in any other state, you still can think about the consequences of your actions. But anger is that one thing where people tend to overlook the consequences of their actions. And so it's not by accident when Allah says, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ These are people who are unable to see the results of their action. Because something has clouded, anger has clouded their mind. And so, so, what does this ayah tell you? That it's sometimes good to suppress your anger. Sometimes it's good to express your anger in subtle ways. Not just making it a war zone necessarily, but being kind, 
by ignoring, by letting them know you're ignoring, by showing them that you're forgiving, so on and so forth. So th this, especially in the which situation that this is referring to? In the household situation. Especially in the household situation. Because let's say, and here's the, here's the thing, here's the interesting thing, is that the closer someone is to you, and the more anger is a result of things not happening your way, right? If some stranger does something to me that I don't want, or if my wife does something to me I don't want, which will make me more angry? Your wife, because you have expectations from that. You don't have expectations from a stranger. So the chances, and in here, in this ayah where Allah says, inna min Inna min azwajikum wa awladukum, awladikum. Don't take it as a statement of khabariya. Not necessarily a statement of khabar. Like as if this is, the case, this is the case that your women and your children are your enemies. But rather put yourself in the position of the person who feels angry because his children and wife are not doing what he wants. And Allah is saying, Allah is, say, Allah is acknowledging that feeling. Allah is what? Acknowledging that feeling that you feel in your own house as if your own children and your wife has become your... The person feels this out of his moral anger, hopefully. Because they're not doing whatever Islamically they're supposed to do, whether it is uh, you want, let's say, your kids to go to an Islamic school but they want to go to public school or you want your wife to do hijab and she's not doing hijab. You feel a sense of now you're, the people who are the closest to you, they have now become your enemies. So one way of taking this ayah is in the sense of khabariya. In the sense of, this is a fact. But in fact, out of these two ayahs, the ayah that says this is a fact is the one in nama. That's the hasr. That's the ayah with the hasr. With the specification. But the ayah, the ayah before that could be taken as khabariya. That generally it is true. You have to know that there is a possibility that from your women, your wives and your children, they can be doing something that will take you out of the pathway. This is a possibility. But the other way to look at it is, Ya yuhilladhina amanu. Okay, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna uh, min, uh, <coughs> over here it can be taken in, because it says inna, here inna can be mean in the sense of acknowledging. Like when you say inna means definitely, right? Inna means what? Definitely. So the word inna min here is, can be used in the sense of acknowledgement. That Allah understands that this is the situation for you. That you feel like you're in a situation where your family has become your enemy. Why? Because you will feel more angry because they're closer to you. You expect your children to listen to you. And if your children don't listen to you, it's going to make you angry. You expect your wife to listen to you. If she doesn't listen to you or care about what you're saying, it's going to make her angry. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Allah knows this, but فَحْزَبُوهُمْ Beware, beware of what? Beware of treating them like your enemies. That's what it would become. Over there, so in the first sentence, in the first khabariya, jumla khabariya, it would mean that your enemies beware of them. In the second case, it would mean that you feel like they're your enemies, so beware of that. Beware of that feeling that you have. Because it's only natural, meaning in other words, this is our human tendency that we're going to feel angry with the people that are close to us. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَإِن تَعْفُوا I know you feel, Allah is saying you feel angry. But in the case of your household, and especially what I'm emphasizing, these surahs, by the way, Surah Al-Taghabun, the ending of Surah Al-Taghabun, Surah Al-Talaq and Surah Al-Tahreem, they are specifically, even in, in, in Surah al uh, Surah al muntahina and then also in Surah Al-Mujadila, these surahs, these musabbihat, these are called their 10 surahs of musabbihat, they are focusing specifically on the household situations. They are focusing on specifically the household situations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that Allah knows that you feel like they are enemies, but beware of this. And if you be kind to them and you overlook them and if you forgive them, then Allah is most forgiving and He's al rahim So, so what does it mean? It means that, number one, what I, advice-wise, and we'll come to what Imam was, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. So, advice-wise, one thing is, 
that every family should know these ayahs of the Quran. Of Surah Al-Taqabun, Surah Al-Talaq, Surah Al-Tahrim, maybe we can even have a dars on these. Uh, but these verses of the Quran that kind of like, and, and so, so what happens? Then you have a certain awareness. And Imam Ghazali mentions this in his uh, works, by the way. Uh, if I can just bring it up quickly. I think I'm going to have to, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to continue this in the next session too. But uh, Imam Ghazali says, then after mentioning that, he says, uh, he, by the way, I want to, so the first thing he discusses is uh, when to express anger and when not to express anger. And the idea is that you express anger when you see something wrong or harm done to others and you should be forgiving when harm is done to you. When it's about Islam, it's okay to be angry. Omar was not angry for himself, he was angry for Islam. Omar, wasn't, uh, Omar was angry when others were hurt, but not for himself. So that's the balance. And then, Imam Ghazali says, the causes which cause anger to grow are self-conceit, self-praise, jests, and ridicule, argument, treachery, too much greed for too much wealth, and name and fame. If these evils are united in a person, his conduct becomes bad and he cannot escape anger. So these things should be removed by their opposites. Self-praise is to be removed by modesty. Pride is to be removed by one's origin and birth, meaning you think you're great, look at what you're born of, right? Greed is to be removed by remaining satisfied with necessary things and miserliness by charity. So, one way to deal with this anger is to do, is to, is to, you deal with any, any problem by its opposite, right? Deal with any anger by its opposite. This, Imam Ghazali mentions this, Many of the scholars of Islam mention this, generally speaking. Then, Imam Ghazali goes into, he says basically, there are, there are uh, different methods of controlling your anger. He says, one thing is, the medicine, the first medicine, is based upon knowledge. And then he says, the first, the first medicine is the person has knowledge that anger is wrong, that you should suppress your anger, that you should be forgiving. And this knowledge needs to be what? Hammered. And then he says the following, the first medicine of knowledge is to think over the rewards of appeasing, of appeasing anger. Meaning, if you appease your anger, then Allah will fit you, fill your heart with iman, to know that. Right? So this is the first thing. Second thing, the second kind of medicine based on knowledge is the fear of the punishment of Allah and to think that the punishment of God is upon, upon me is greater than my, punish, uh, is greater than my uh, anger upon this uh, person. So to, to keep in mind that maybe Allah is more angry with me than I am with this person. So if I forgive this person, then maybe Allah will forgive me. Third is, the medicine is based on knowledge is to think about the ugly face of the angry man which is just like that of the furious beast uh, who basically, uh, you know, who has lost his... Uh, think of the most ugliest face of the angry man. He says, just think about that person who's really angry, what that face looks like. You want to look like that? So this is what he says. The fifth one he says is based upon the knowledge to think that the devil is advising you to be angry. The fifth one is to remind yourself that am I angry because of shaitan? Am I angry because of the devil? And in that ayah, who is your greatest enemy? Shaitan. So over here when it says, Inna min azwajikum wa awladikum aduullakum, it is indirectly saying how Allah is causing you, because you're angry, they're not following Islam, how shaitan is coming in the middle and, and, and they have now by proxy become your tools of shaitan to be your to, to be your enemies. The fifth kind of medicine is to think that the devil will be advising by saying you will be weak if you do not get angry. Right? You will be weak if you do not get angry. And remind yourself of the hadith, for example, Imam Ghazali doesn't mention this here, he mentions this before this part, where, where the hadith, the very famous hadith is the strong one is the one who can like suppress his anger, not the wrestler who puts down another person, right? And then he says, "This, uh, the, this, uh, and the, and the other reason. What have I got? What have I got to get angry about? Everything is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa taala. So whether it is the husband or the wife, in terms of the first level, is to be aware of these aspects of awareness of knowledge. 
right? That when you're angry, you need to be aware of that is this from sh this could be from shaitan it is the qadr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this really how i want to be losing my rationality you know is if i forgive this person or let go this person from what he's done then allah will forgive me and uh, and then how much rewards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can possibly give you for eating up your anger or drinking up your anger okay the medicine the, med the then there is uh, the medicine which has to do with actions so one is based upon knowledge and the other is has to do with action how much time do i have five minutes five minutes okay uh what i wanted to do really um okay so we will inshallah finish imam ghazali and then go on to the next part uh, hopefully so imam ghazali says different <coughs> things he says number one what can you do in terms of action number one is to say a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim something we discussed last time and then uh he mentions, uh, if anger does not go away by this means, which is to say, you will sit down if you're standing, lie down if you're sitting, come near to the earth as you have been created of earth. <coughs> so this is one thing that he uh, says, that the reason to go near the earth is because you've been created of the earth and to remind yourself that. So uh, in his sense, when he says lay down, he doesn't mean lay down on the bed, but uh, the um, you know, the mother. Right? Uh, go back to your, uh, remind yourself of your origins. And then he says, uh, thus make yourself calm like the earth. And in fact, that's very interesting because in studies of meditation, if you remember my lecture series on concentration in salah, the lecture series that I did on concentration on salah, what we know is that when you touch something physical, like when you're physically touching yourself, there is, physical things are, you know, like for example, the opposite, bir and bahar. Bir is land, and bahar is ocean. Ocean is unstable, right? And bir is... No, no, no. No, bar. No, bar is... Oh, bar, yes, yes, yes. So there's a difference between bar and bar. Bir al-khayr. Bar Right, 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 right. So uh, the root words are the same, though. The root one is bir and then bar. And the other is bir, or bar. Yes, bar and bahar, you're right. So, land is what? Land is what? Stable. Okay, so, uh, so anyhow, so he says, then go down to the earth, make yourself calm like earth. And I was saying in, medita medica in meditation studies, what they tell you is, one of the reasons they, they have these, like people that are depressed, and people that are going through different therapies, they will do what we call a physical touch of your physical awareness of your body because the one thing if you feel everything in your life is going haywire and there's storm everywhere in your life your body is stable right so you get a sense of stability by touching yourself yes i'm here my hands are here i have a sense, sense, some sense of stability so there's some studies that have to do with that but anyhow imam ghazali interestingly enough mentions the same thing as as those uh, meditation studies do Thus make yourself calm like the earth, the cause of wrath is heat, and its opposite is to lie down on the ground and make the body calm and cool. The Prophet said, anger is a burning coal. Don't you see your eyebrows wide and eyes reddish? So when one of you feels angry, let him sit down. If he's standing, lie down. If he's sitting, and then he says, Imam al said, if still anger does not stop, make ablution with cold water or take a bath, as fire cannot be extinguished without water. The Prophet said, when one, one of you gets angry, let him make ablution wudu with water, as anger arises out of fire. In another narration, the Prophet says, anger comes out from, comes from the devil, and the devil is made of fire. So these are some of the advices that Imam Ghazali has regarding anger. And then we will study all of this in reference to these four major studies that are before us. And then we will go back and look at the state of the Ummah again, also in reference to some of these aspects. But uh, I want us to become more aware of this, uh, you can say, subconscious anger that I was talking about, that we all carry, right? And so in reference to that, we have to be kinder to our family because we're like the victimized person who has an opportunity to victimize others. And so we have to be especially aware of that because it is tearing apart our communities and at many times it's tearing apart our families. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum.